Yep. Great. Good. Great. All right. So a little self-introduction is a retired uh, submariner um, and a space systems engineer. And uh, my last uh, my last big gig before I retired was the chief architect for the Air Force Satellite Control Network. So uh, believe it or not, I, I designed a lot of stuff, but I never actually played physically with the antennas. So when I got involved in the Deep Space Exploration Society, those guys actually put me in that antenna up the pedestal. And um, besides cleaning dirt out of every groove in, in there and that com trailer, uh, I learned a lot. <laughs> and so now we're doing pulsars. And, uh, and my goal in life as a retiree is to get as many pulsars as Wolfgang and to uh, write as many technical articles as Whitman Reeve. All right, so that's my, so I'm in the right group here um, trying to make a name for myself in the amateur radio astronomy community. All right. So as part of that, what I was, uh, uh, I got very interested in you know, our trips down to the VLA. Uh, uh, that first uh, Sarah meeting we went to uh, at the VLA really uh, spurred my uh, interest in uh, the interferometry, the big interferometry guys. And uh, so I started going to uh, uh, their technical uh, conferences on on processing the data to turn them into those pictures. And from there, you learn how to run the CASA program uh, and you learn how to do the VLA, the ALMA, and all the other inter big interferometry projects that you can process the raw data into, into those nice images. So, uh, um, so I took a number of those I think I'm on my fourth one right now, um, over four years. And um, this is sort of the result. Uh, I thought it would be interesting. I'm not going to go through every one of these um, 100%. I'm just going to show you sort of the, the range you can get to if, you've, uh, if you want to play with these. And, and, and I was able to do it with a pretty high-end laptop. In fact, the Pulsar laptop we got was what, what really broke the, uh, uh, you know, broke the log jam in my head on how to do this with the CASA program because it takes the same Unix um, and, and you know, I had a terabyte drive and I had high speed and all that to run the CASA program with these large files. So it's a, so when you do get the high-end Pulsar stuff going, you can actually do the, the, the VLA uh, stuff uh, quite readily. So the, um, there are uh, uh, in this data set, so, these big antenna systems do have, um, uh, they do store their stuff in archives. And uh, so uh, I have not yet got an official, um, and, and that's one of my future goals is to actually uh, pre put, put a request in to use the antenna for some astronomical phenomena, but I haven't done that yet. So meanwhile, I've been harvesting the data that's in the databases of these guys, trying to find neat items that I could uh, process and turn into pictures. And what helps is that these guys also have tutorials um, that help you walk through the basic processes to get the, uh, the things done. So um, these are the four antenna systems. Um, and uh, I think that the, uh, what's cool is the European uh, very long baseline is, uh, uh, is probably the largest overall extent, so the highest resolution version of that. Um, okay, and, and just to tell you, all my, inner, all my slides here from my trips down there, so these are my uh, pictures, um, and uh, uh, so it's uh, sort of fun to show these off too. Okay, so what did I need for this? Um, uh, the imaging and data reduction workshops. Uh, if you go to the NRA, NRAO website, they and go under meetings. They have uh, they show you these things. Now the key is that if you want to go down to these things, or they just had we just had the 17th uh, annual synthesis workshop online this year. Um, you have to have a um, you need to get in early. They're free with the exception of some basic costs, and then you have to just pay your uh, you just have to get a, a hotel and uh, travel and stuff down there, but they, but basically it's all it's basically free. Um, the the laptop though 
um, one of the limitations there is you can use their computers, uh, but if they're if they have already got the the sessions full, they're really limited by their the number of terminals they've got down there in their rooms. So I actually brought my laptop and I was able to get in because I brought a laptop that I could just sit. I don't even need their terminals. I can use my own, and they let me come in uh, even though they were already full. Uh, Linux is uh, pretty much what they're using down there. Unix. Um, to, to run the CASA programs. Uh, so, but you, the CASA programs and the tutorials are all free, uh, free downloads. So if you get that, you can start loading those and start uh, working the, uh, these things. Um, there are, uh, right now there's two, but there's more of these, but the two I use here is the uh, VLA. Uh, you can select all sorts of menu items to select the object you want to look at. Uh, you can do it by frequency, you can do it by the optional position, uh, various other things. And then the Alma has a slightly different one. Um, actually, they have a nice star map. You can actually click the star on the screen if you if you actually knew where that was, and then it'll come up with the exact one. Um, plus, the, nice, the other thing I use all, uh, quite a bit on both these is that they'll actually show you the publication has been published for that particular image. So when, it, when somebody does... When somebody uses an image from uh, any of these big antennas, one of the requirements is that you tell the uh, the NRAO what publication you used it in, so that they can document that and get you know they get credit. You know, a lot of times this is all free if you actually do this. You can get. I mean, uh, it doesn't cost you anything to actually observe on these antennas. You have to go through a science and you know and you're competing, but once you get once you get accepted, it's free, right? So how does the how do these guys sort of make their money or make their fame? They basically, by the publication, you know, how many publications, uh, you know, how much science was actually derived by publications from these, uh, uh, from this data? So that's how, that's why, but they have that great database, the publications. So the first thing I do, if I'm going to do this, I go into the publications and look up all the different papers that use that image and they're really nice neat to look at and you can really figure out you know how they what that image is doing for you um okay everybody understands the rfi problem but this is an example that actually was in one of the uh, tutorials that the um you know this is it, it's by the way this is amplitude versus frequency um and um and this is an example of what an rfi signal looks like and that since it's it's self cal it's you know basically it, it when you get the data it actually you know displays everything so what flagging does is i can sit there and i can basically put a box around this and say flag and flagging says okay i'm gonna it doesn't eliminate it from the database but it basically turns it off as a source of data and so if you look at that and I, when i flag that thing you see how where the rest of the signal looks like in amplitude. So you could tell exactly that you you know this thing would wipe out most of your data, but this is the levels that you're at here um, when you do this. Um, this is an example of the EVLA antenna. And I think it's in the I keep getting a D or A that the the smallest configuration. Um, the configurations are. Um, and, and each of these antennas are labeled uh, as their physical antenna. Each physical antenna actually has unique attributes to it. Um, they have different gains, they have different, maybe even com some components to it. So they're all characterized very well on the computer as an individual antenna. Um, and so, uh, and now the other thing to note here is that you have to pick out a reference antenna and you try to pick one out that's in this somewhere in the center of this because that's where the the core is. Now, uh, when I'm going to show you the next set of slides, this is an interferometer. So, how does an interferometer work with multiple antennas? Well, basically, it it does a beamform individually between each two antennas. So, each you know each two antennas has a separate you know beamforming, and then they add up all those separate antennas. Um, so that gets, so that 27 antennas gets, you know, whatever 27 to, you know, to the nth is uh, combinations on there. 
Um, but this is all available online, by the way. So uh, I didn't, uh, what they'll do is that they'll, they'll say your, your antenna positions are available for that observations. Could have been 10 years ago they did it, but they, the, obs you know, the antennas, where they were located, et cetera, are all available. And you have to do some calibration with these things too, because their actual positions, you know, the calibrated positions actually have to be known for some of your uh, data. Okay, uh, this is a, you know, at first I couldn't figure out how they were getting, how does a bunch of antennas actually form this image? You know, where's the, I mean, how's the data being populated? And I don't know if you could tell these two are dots here. These are, you know, an example of two antennas. Don't worry about the equations or anything like that. Look at this chart here and this chart here. This is the actual, you know, two. In, if I have two antennas and they're just standing still, the Earth's not moving, then I get sort of a pattern like this when you uh, do a Fourier transform on it. All right, so that's just two antennas combining a signal. Okay, if I do five antennas, then I've got five. You know, each of those antennas, each of the five antennas, actually talk to each other, and that produces a a bigger, a more detailed pattern. And you see where we're going here, 11 antennas and then 27 antennas. So this is the max number of antennas for the VLA. Now, one of the key issues they always have is all these, um, these extra, this extra signal that is happening, um, artifacts is what they're calling them. And you can tell here, one of the problems with the VLA um, is that you've got a lot of antennas that are in line with each other and very few antennas that actually combine to form your outskirts here, right? So you get these very bright patches here and in Fourier transform that gives you a lot of artifacts that aren't real, right? So there's, there's not real data there, but they're bright because there's so many combinations of antennas that just happen to form a long line. So for the VLA, because there's three, three arms, and they're not randomly distributed antennas, they tend to form these artifacts that you can almost immediately say that's from the VLA because I see the arms, okay? So that's, this is assuming, by the way, that I am, the earth is not moving and I am just looking straight um, on this antenna, all right, at the source. Well, the earth's moving, but I'm tracking it, all right? Um, and uh, that gives me, you can sort of see that there's like three items here, three, you know, that's the sources that they're looking for right there, those three guys, all right? Now, how do I get, how do I, you know, that doesn't fill in very much. You know, that's not a very dense pattern. So how do I start getting a dense pattern? Well, the Earth's rotation actually causes, starts filling in that the pattern. So you got that same thing, but now I'm rotating, this is a two hour rotation. You can start seeing how the pattern fills in, especially in the center, and uh, and even in the outskirts, I start filling in the patterns. You can see those sources are starting to pick up more because the density of the, you gotta think of them as like pixels. The, the density of the pixels is increasing. I'm filling in the pixels in this, uh, this nice canvas here. This is a four hour rotation, so you can see how it's getting in more deeper. And the actual, the objects are filling in, you know, are, are starting to show up more. You start seeing those artifacts and you start seeing that, you know, obviously that's the rotation patterns that you see. Okay, now, um, that sort of gives you good, but this is with one frequency. Now, how do you fill in the other frequencies? Well, all of these baselines are based on a, your, your wavelength between the antennas. If I change the wavelength between the antennas, that means that I've got different you know, different peaks in different locations for the same object. And, um, and I, I can actually fill in the holes if I use different frequencies simultaneously. And that's why these antennas have multiple uh, frequencies and channels on them that I can, they could do that. So if I, so you look at this pattern and then I go, okay, what if I have two simultaneous frequencies start seeing that thing really does start filling in that those holes with the two frequencies and then three frequencies and then uh, you know but you start seeing that that's how the 
the interferometry actually fills in the holes to make a start making pictures. Okay. And uh, I thought that was just a, this, I didn't produce this slide. This is a Ravashi or Rao from one of the instructors in RAO. Um, we presented this and I just, the light just came on in my eyes of how this all works before I couldn't figure out how they make a picture out of a, a bunch of dots. Okay. All right. Um, this is an example of one of the artifacts. And um, so this is all false color imaging. I can make that, I can make any of the levels just about any color I want. So this is one of the standard colors that they use, but you can see that they actually uh, calculates the primary beam. And then you can actually do contours for the different, uh, you know, this is in Janskys per beam. So you can see how low we're at. This is two times 10 to the minus third is the top level Janskys per beam, all right? And then you got a beam size. So this is an example of uh, how low you can go on um, a screen and this is the kind of results you get. Now you have to run a, a thing called clean, which basically does all your Fourier transforms and it actually helps you pull out the signal from the noise and get rid of some of these artifacts that are sitting there because these artifacts look like real sources sometimes. Okay, so what are some of the cool things? Well, one is I wanted to sample all the different, you know, something of each uh, running this thing to see if I can actually produce a product. And I was looking for, you know, your basic products, uh, you know, and then I was looking for how do they do the chemical signatures? How do you do uh, um, absorption lines uh, like you've had, et cetera. So um, the tutorials have a lot of these where they actually say, okay, here's an absorption line example, et cetera. Just download the following uh, file and then do the processing and even walks you through the steps in processing. So a lot of these things are like that. And I actually show you which ones and do the links of, uh, the, of what's processing and stuff like that. And then, okay, now, by the way, this is the uh, command center of the, uh, uh, of the VLA. Uh, not, you know, technically there's not a lot there. There's just a bunch of uh, screens there, but they'll monitor the weather there. They'll monitor the location of the antennas. And one of the key things they do do there is they, um, uh, they do put a log together that says, okay, during this observation, and by name, by whoever the uh, PI, the principal investigator was, what is the, um, what was the status of each and every antenna? Maybe one antenna, you know, uh, was down for maintenance or another antenna had a problem with one of the, uh, the channels, et cetera. They will mark that down. And so that becomes a permanent record with that observation. And that's one of the first things they recommend you look at because when you process the data, you can flag the different, and you know, by antenna, by frequency, by various other things. And if the operator said that that was down, it, the data still may be showing up, um, and you want to get rid of it fast because it's not really uh, good data. So, uh, so that's what the uh, the operators do, and they have a. It's all, it's really automated. You know, basically, there's a team that puts together the schedule. These guys implement it. I think there's only three or four of these guys um, that do this for a living. Uh, and I understand the guy that does the midnight watch is a character. Uh, and they've been doing that for years. Okay. Okay, this is my T5, uh, a binary black hole. I think the two black holes are like over here, one there and one here down here. And, um, and one of the key things on this, I wanted to understand how do you do polarization uh, using the system. Um, and uh, this thing will actually uh, allow you to process polarization. Um, so you can start seeing where the magnetic field lines are, this is, uh, et cetera. Okay. And, and just an example of what I've got here is this top area is called the observing log. This thing is, you know, that the observer, the actual observer who requested this is uh, Dr. Manuel uh, Merijim, I believe, and um, what the date was and uh, all his information. So it's very important. And this is the, this is the actual archive number. So if I wanted to go back to this exact binary star, I'd go to that number. So it's very important to actually acknowledge the observer who submitted the observation and uh, got the observation. But after a period of time, they, um, they released the 
observation for the general public because these guys, they, they got a, a, a time where they're allowed to have it for themselves so they can get their papers written and things like that. And then, but after that, then it's, it's open and it's open in the archives. So most of the data is open in the archives and just the newest data may not be open yet because they're still writing papers on them. Um, here, I just uh, I just tried to, because I'm in a total learning experience with, uh, especially, um, uh, I have more learning experience with astronomy or, or learning curve in astronomy than I do almost the RF stuff. So uh, um, I actually tried to put together some kind of information, background information on what I was actually doing the data reduction for. So this is the actual thing I got. Uh, I got Bill out of CASA. This is just background information from whatever source, Wikipedia or whatever. Um, the tutorial, if there's a tutorial down here, um, the link down here works and uh, you go to the actual tutorial and download the same file and uh, process the same file I did. So you can actually reproduce what I did by those links. Um, this, is a, oh, this is a real cool one. It's called a title disruption event. Assassin, which is an amazing name for a title disruption event, but Assassin 14 LI. This is when a, a black hole eats a star, right? Um, and um, the uh, this is what it looks like, but that you can't you can't see that star getting eaten by the black hole. This is just the the location, what the VLA can see of that object. Um, but if you if you look up the detail on it, it's actually you know the black hole, and then you got a, a stellar uh, tidal disrupt. They call it a tidal disruption, but it's fundamentally the black hole is eating the star. Um, and um, uh, I thought it was really cool. But, so I'm saying a lot of these things, just the pixel size and the size of the VLA can't see that that level of detail. Um, and I'm not quite sure what they've actually discovered that that was a, you know, and that's where my lessons, my learning curve is, is what is the actual thing that caused them to think this was a tidal disruption event? And I still don't know that for 100%. Um, Cygnus X1, I think we talked about that. It's also a black hole. Um, and um, so uh, that's a, uh, uh, you can see the different levels of the, uh, the signal coming out of here. And that's the different uh, um, contours. Uh, Cygnus X3, another black hole uh, or a neutron star, they're not sure which. Um, same with uh, M4, uh, the GRO uh, 0422 plus 32. Now you realize that when it says 0422, that's the uh, right ascension and the plus 32 is the declination. That's actually the first one I showed you guys. You see these extra contours out here. Those could actually be real, that there's actually some signal out there that's above background, or that could be, um, that could be a, uh, an artifact of the, of the antenna. Okay. Um, Another black hole, a Q-type star binary. So this is a, 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 a Q-type star rotating around a black hole. As I'm saying, uh, you gotta be better scientists than me to go figure out why that, how they could tell that from there. But uh, I, one of the key nice things about this whole process is that it, it actually gives you the detailed uh, right ascension declination and it'll do it in a FITS file and FITS files, I could download a Hubble image and in a FITS file and overlay it with the these images in a FITS file and it will actually overlay, it'll overlay them on top of each other at the right scale, okay? I haven't done that yet, but that's one of my goals is that we could take all our radio astronomy observations and overlay it with all your optical or all your other observations from different radio sources and and you can start seeing a pattern, uh, you know, emerge uh, between the optical radio and the, all, everything else. And uh, if you document what frequency you're on here, you know, for example, infrared versus UV versus X-ray versus optical, you can start coming up with some science on those. Okay. Um, and by the way, this is the this is what the feeds of the VLA antennas look like. Um, there's actually, uh, you can see that's the, uh, 
the low frequency, one of the low frequency ones, and then you got various other ones running around there. These, by the way, are heaters. That uh, one of the problems they've got is that in the mornings the you got dew on these top of these guys, and that that water is bad, so they put heaters on those to try to warm them up. Uh, I also learned that because of this white here, you can actually point this thing directly at the sun, and they use that to melt snow. Um, there's also some antennas. I don't think I got a picture of that right above this um, that uh, um, that are really uh, dipoles that they can start looking at the very low VLF kind of data. Um, there is a this is fixed. So how do they change? They've got a subreflector above this, and the subreflector is slightly uh, warped so that when the signal comes up, it hits the subreflector and they can move the subreflector. They can, it's on a motor, they can move it in order to aim the signal back down on any one of these, uh, you know, any one of these horns here. So that's how they can do it. And that'll also allows them to rapidly change frequency with the same observation, which was really an advantage for this antenna is that you can sit there and run multiple frequencies uh, just by moving the uh, subreflector um, and, uh, and, and bring down a lot of data with different frequencies. Um, binary, super, binary supermassive black hole quasar. I thought that was the coolest, you know, uh, thing. And it's uh, the EVLBI. So that was that one picture with multiple antennas all around Europe. Uh, but you can clearly see two the two binaries uh, here, uh, 3C345, which is uh, also, I think, a calibration source. So, uh, and uh, you can also see the size of the beam. The EVLBI is very high resolution because there's a lot of antennas spread all, you know, all around Europe, um, and you get a high resolution there. So that was a really cool uh, uh, processing on that one. I just like the fact that saying super binary supermassive black hole quasar. I thought, I just thought it was the coolest thing. Okay, Sagittarius A star. All right, so the, the uh, binary or the uh, black hole in the center of our galaxy. Uh, if I think about this twice, I should have changed, I could change the pixel size a little better, but uh, that's what it looks like. Um, there's, if you, if you look at actual pictures of that, there actually is that, that angle there on this thing, but um, you can actually see it. Uh, and you're, what you're looking at is you're looking at the accretion disk around it. Not You're not seeing the black hole. And all these black hole ones, you're looking at the accretion disk. Or you're looking at the, uh, the signal from the binary star that's rotating around there. So uh, you're looking at the artifacts of that there's a black hole there, but you can't see the black hole direct, obviously. Um, this was, that was from ALMA. Okay, and there's a picture, by the way, of the... Uh, um, of the uh, subreflector on the VLA antennas, and you can't see, it, but there uh, we did. I did get a look at one of these things that was sitting on the ground in the uh, in the maintenance bay, and there is a, a nice angle there somewhere around one of these guys. And these are the in different uh, dipoles that are up there to be able to get some of the low frequency uh, components there. So they do have some of that available for everybody. Uh, okay, Cygnus A. This is really nice because, it, you know, obviously the black hole is here and this is the beams coming off the black hole. So those are actually, those are not, those are, think of those as the, the you know, the beams that are affecting the interstellar matter on both sides of the black hole and the be, and the things shooting out on each side. And you're just seeing the artifacts of that with the object that's in the center is the, uh, is actually causing all that to happen. So I did get that nice picture of that. Uh, it doesn't look quite the same as that picture, but um, uh, I was able to get that pretty well there. Um, if you're an expert at this thing, you get it done very well. Um, you can obviously get really good pictures of this thing. Uh, uh, I'm not an expert, but I was getting better. Um, also, what the at least the Alma does is all, they've got what's called a pipeline. Avila has it too. Uh, it's called a pipeline. <coughs> and they will automatically calibrate and do all the flag and produce a picture for you um, that you can either use directly um, as your science picture or you can uh, 
use that as a start off and then go and, and reprocess your own raw data. So uh, my interest is in taking the exact raw data and, uh, and doing all the flagging, calibration, and uh, et cetera, and the, and the pic images of it. Um, this is a, a supernova remnant, 3C391. Uh, uh, and, and you can tell I'm trying to take some of the pictures here and say, okay, am I even close? And say, yeah, I think I was uh, pretty close there. Because uh, most of the time, I mean, part of my learning curve is I didn't know what these things are supposed to look like. So uh, I basically had to go, I tried to find a some kind of a, an image to compare them against. Um, and uh, it turned out pretty good. This is the bottom. So you saw those horns on the top of the dish. This is the bottom of the, uh, the uh, this is inside the, di uh, the, the bottom of the dish. Um, so this is where these, each of the horns came up. And by the way, there's a cryogenic cooler right here with the receivers in it. Very, very noisy. I mean, they're click, 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 very noisy things, all right? And so one of the things I said, the biggest problem that the VLA has in terms of cost is uh, keeping those cryogenic coolers running. All right, so that's, you know, a million dollars a year, I think, was the budget for those, just to keep them running. Um, okay, um, asymptotic giant branch AGB, so uh, um, uh, basically very, uh, uh, this is a um, black hole that's uh, very active um, in the center of a galaxy. And what I want to show here is the different uh, frequency bands. So this is one frequency band, this is another frequency band. Same image, same dimensions, just different frequencies. So you can see that there's different, different things in there that you can see at different frequencies. So it's good to go and, and do multiple frequencies to get your science there just because there's different, you can just see different levels on this, all right. Uh, gravitational lenses. Well, this has nothing to do with gravity except it's on the a track. This is the uh, mover that they move the uh, antennas with. Um, and uh, we got to see a couple being moved when we were out there. So uh, very cool. And, uh, and by the way, if you're a railroad person, they do have a railroad out there that they, uh, they move uh, these antennas. So they were doing railroad repairs last time we were out there. Um, black hole binary, okay. Another black hole binary. So basically, you can see the two, two different uh, binary objects here um, on this. Oops, sorry. Now, what I'm saying, gravitational lenses, the um, two, and this is a prime example of a gravitational lens. Um, what will happen is that the uh, a, a far distant object will be between there'll be a, a galaxy that's in between us and a far distant object. And what you're observing with the, um, the, the near-term object, you start seeing a multiple, a bunch of what looks like little galaxies around it. Well, what's actually happening is that the closer galaxy is, is basically um, gravitationally lensing the, uh, the farther galaxies picture around it and it looks like multiple copies of the same of the back galaxy uh, or some some aspect of the, uh, a picture of the other uh, galaxy so this is an example of uh, a gravitationally lensed um, and it also has a, a hydrogen absorption line so it gives me two it gives a gravitationally lensed object and it does have a, a nice absorption line also that you can observe now, one of the key things on this gravitation, uh, this, is that I actually, we actually measured it at 390.597 megahertz, and yet it was a 21 centimeter hydrogen neutral line. So this is an example of what Paul was talking about, is that uh, the redshift from the expansion of the universe is actually caused uh, a hydrogen line that started at X number of billion, uh, light years out is uh, is now at 390 megahertz. So that's a cool example. And this is in megahertz down here, right? That the whole the whole spectrum was shifted down. You see the hydrogen absorption line drop. 
Okay, um, this is a this is actually where the a lot of the cablings are turning. This is uh, uh, Dr. Paul Sutter. Five minutes. Uh, he's been there for thirty years. Hello. Five minutes. Well, five minutes. Okay, not not, not Paul Sutter. Um, Paul uh, Perl Meter. Yeah, I think so. Anyway, uh, five minutes. So let me keep going through. I did. I uh, want to do Alpha. Uh, Centauri A and B, and then Alpha approximate Centauri, all right, uh, just because they have potential planets there, and um, I wanted to see if I can see them. This is an example of that, and there's a great example of A and B uh, and, uh, and uh, Proxima Centauri, which has our closest, uh, closest planet to us, exoplanet, is an Alpha Centauri C. Uh, Betelgeuse. I wanted to figure out what's going on with Betelgeuse. Uh, didn't quite. Uh, I can, you, you can observe asteroids. Uh, you can, Titan is actually a calibration source, so Saturn's moon and Titan. Um, M100 spiral galaxy, so you can see the spirals. Uh, more galaxies. Uh, another galaxy, and this is from the ATCA, Australian Telescope Compact Array. So even though that's a smaller one, uh, it has some uh, very good uses on it. Um, this here is what I was trying to go into spectral lines. So you can actually see different, uh, uh, you see basically radio velocity shifts. And, you, and even though that looks messy, that's actually because you're actually observing the radio velocity, fr uh, velocity changes instead of trying to get a, a, a single frequency. So it's, it looks messy, but it's showing all those colors are velocity differences. Uh, quasars, uh, you know, basically you just run through the quasar pictures. Now these, all these are online. This is another one that you can actually do the polarization on. So I got good polarization data. So you can actually do the IQU polarization angles, et cetera. It'll actually calculate that with the data. So, uh, and this is actually a, a known calibrator for uh, polarization. So uh, that was really nice. You know, I hadn't done polarization yet uh, in my uh, analysis. So this is a real, real cool result for me to get polarization out of there. Uh, another quasar, and this is a binary quasar, I believe. Um, and, uh, Phase calibrator, so uh, different phases. Uh, you always have to have a phase calibrator when you're, when you're doing that, when you're doing this analysis. So yeah, calibration is very important. So you, basically what you'll do is you'll, you'll tell the, you have to tell them in your request what calibrations, what flux phase um, calibrations you're gonna use. And then um, it'll, the computer will actually aim it at your source and then it'll aim it at your calibrator. Then it'll aim it at your source and it'll keep doing that. And so you've got multiple copies of both your sources and your calibrators so the computer can actually, you know, calibrate you in both phase and flux and, uh, and you know, polarization if you've got that kind of stuff going. So uh, uh, these are really cool protoplanetary disks. Um, and, and by the way, some of this is, uh, now I'm starting to mess with colors. So I got a different uh, color, set, you know, system set up here. Um, another protoplanetary disk. This one's my cool one because it actually looked very close to what the, uh, the Wikipedia had. Um, and, uh, you can just, you tell the central star and the, uh, and, you know, almost where the, uh, the planets around there are, are you know, eating around the, uh, you know, the, uh, it, the medium that's around. So you can tell where they're carving out their, their slice in there. Um, just more, you guys can look at this stuff. It's all good. Um, so what I want to do in the future is that uh, right now I've got to the point where I can make pretty pictures. I can do some data analysis, uh, but I really want to go into uh, how do I can get real science data out of this thing. You know, I don't get quantitative data that I can actually make a paper or something like that uh, and derive something, you know, chemical signal signatures. They're really interested now in the ability to get, you know, find different chemicals and for example, protoplanetary disks to see, you know, if they can find any, uh, uh, any, you know, industrial life or whatever like that they could find. 
Uh, distance measurements, I'm not quite sure how to do distance on this yet. Uh, and moments, the moments are, you know, basically your speed, speed changes uh, across all the different systems. And uh, polarization and magnetic fields, uh, there's tons of magnetic field work, especially in other galaxies. And you can derive a lot of information from magnetic fields. 